Good afternoon, my friends. This is the Grim Flayer. Hope you're doing very well today, and I hope you are ready to Red Rock yet again. We are playing Rakdos on Earth, Rakdos Skelemental, Red Rock, uh, or Greenless Jund, as our donor referred to it in our chat. And speaking of the donor, Happy birthday, buddy. This is a birthday present for Alex Cote. I guess a birthday present kind of from himself to himself, uh, laundering the present through me, right? Um, by way of the Grim Flayer. So, Alex, uh, happy birthday, buddy. This one is for you, and Alex is a relatively new Patreon supporter, but a very generous one. This is his second donation league in recent weeks, and, you know, it's a funny origin story. Uh... Alex was all set up in a recent FNM, uh, in the day leading up to a recent FNM, I should say, to play Shadow at his local store, right? And uh, he's getting, you know, himself ready to go and getting his stuff together in preparation for that, only to find that he has lost a copy of the titular card Shadow itself, Death Shadow. So what is a man to do when he loses his Shadow? Well, he has to audible. And Alex looked through his binder and kind of started noticing that he had all of the components of this Rakdos deck. Ended up just on a whim, last minute, bringing it, and crushing the entire field of Uro decks and Big Mana decks, if I recall correctly, which is exactly what this deck kind of does relative to other black base mid range decks. It does have a higher ability to just punch through and outgrind or out deplete the decks that usually do go over the top of other mid range decks. So that kind of inadvertent, you know, audible. And uh, that that's what led Alex to loving this deck, and indeed what led us to play it here for him today. So uh, just to briefly talk about the list, most of you have seen me play this before, at least once on the channel. Um, we have a very safe land base insofar as we have 22 lands, whereas 21 to 22 is the norm. We're at the high range of that, and we also have a low utility land count of just one. So we're not getting greedy with the land base at all. We have nine fetch lands to better fuel Kroxa, which is something that Alex wanted to do. Fuel the Kroxa a little bit more than get too cute with another utility land. And other than that... Notable inclusions, and this is Alex's list that he and I talked about, some changes that I suggested he did make, other ones he left on the table, right? So, seven discard spells. I like that in this shell a lot, although I don't like it in BGX decks right now. Uh, there are times when I do, now's not one of them, but I think in Rakdos you can pretty much always justify it, and he's on seven, so we're all good with that. Uh, two bush, uh, excuse me, two push for bolts. Uh, we talked about a 3-3 split, but in the end I said, even though push is really well positioned, I think Bolt is a slightly better fit for the deck. If we're not certain, let's lean in favor of the proactive nature of Bolt being able to go upstairs, never really being dead. Uh, Cling to Dust. This is a card that was not in Alex's deck, and I made a very strong case for the recurring theme among all of my recent donation leagues is that if I'm suggesting changes, it is to respect the graveyard synergistic decks and or the RDW decks, the mono, red, or red-based aggro decks more. And Cling to Dust, of course, does both. It's also a way to get a little consistency in a deck that otherwise can lack it. So to Cling, this is my admonition, and, and Alex agreed. Uh, three on Earth. Three Dark Confidant, down from four, had to find a spot for the Kling somewhere, but I do like three to four Bob a lot in this deck. Um, in the two drop slot, we have Ransack the Lab and Dreadbore as two ofs each. Now, Ransack the Lab, Alex and I both absolutely love this card, but when we were talking, I did point out that most recent 5 and O's and challenge placement lists have actually cut it. Um, I guess it's just a little dirtily, even though it's very, very powerful, and even though it can lead to decidedly non-dirtily turn threes if you're, like, ransacking a Skelemental into the bin uh, and then finding it on Earth to buy it back with, you understand, right? Um, so I did point that out. Um, despite that, Alex and I are both happy to continue running it as a two of. Hopefully it won't be too clunky. Hopefully it will be yet another good consistency tool. Two copies of Dreadbore. This is something that Alex brought to the table I pointed out as not exactly orthodox. I like the card a lot, but playing two copies of this 
is getting a little bit more reactive, a little bit more answer-oriented than these decks usually tend to be. Not by much, just by a little bit. Alex agreed, but still kind of wanted to run it like this, and we made enough other changes that I was like, sure, I can get down with the two Dreadbore. Uh, the rest of the main deck is pretty stock. Two Kroxa, three Liliana, and then four copies of Spyro, who does represent the glue that holds the deck together in so many ways, and indeed four copies of perhaps the most iconic card of the deck, Lightning Skelemental. In the sideboard, we also have a lot of familiar faces. Three copies of Collective Brutality. Two each of Plague Engineer, Pillage, uh, Nile Spellbomb, we're talking about the normal stuff first, and then one each of Boyle and Ashiok Dream Render. No surprises there, these are all red-black mid-range staples right now, but then we have the sideboard rounded out by a couple of less common sites. Angraf's Rampage, this is kind of an innovation that Alex made after we had talked about the list. He came back later and said, hey, what about Angraf's Rampage as a two of instead of, I think we were considering a braid in that slot. Um, and I said, you know what, this is actually a really, really good fit in the deck. I'm definitely down to play it, so this will be fun to play. And then Necromentia, which is Alex's real spicy inclusion. Um, this is one of the newfangled extraction effects. There are a couple other printings that have been similar to this. I've got to be honest, I'm not that high on them in general. I don't think they are... I, I think they're modern playable, but I don't think they're an effect that you really need to reach for in modern. It just seems like these days, every combo deck or every big mana deck has multiple win conditions and multiple copies um, or multiple playsets of linchpin cards, even if they're not direct win conditions. In other words, there's very few decks these days that will scoop to a resolved Necromentia or Unmoored Ego or Surgical Extraction if you've discarded the prime target first, you know what I mean? Nevertheless, it is kind of an interesting fit in the deck in a few different ways. It can serve as auxiliary graveyard hate, and it is mega, mega spicy. So even though I would probably not register this card when he brought it to me, I was like, yeah, that looks fun. Let's play it. And hey, maybe I'll be proven uh, wrong about that, or maybe it will just perform well regardless. So anyway, my friends... That is that, and we are going to get into a league right now with Alex Cote's Greenless Jund uh, with Red Rock. Happy birthday again, Alex. This one is for you, my friend. And as we are finding our first opponent, let's say thank you so much for watching. Thank you to all Patreon supporters, as always. And we've got four new Patreon supporters to shout out. You love to see it. We have a new Inquisitor, David Castillo who writes excellent, excellent YouTube comments well worth reading. One of many patrons who are uh, very valuable purveyors of insight, if you will. Let's put it that way. Uh, so thank you, David, for signing up. We also have Matt Picar. Um, oh, we're against Aspiring Spike. We're probably on stream. And... Spike will keep seven. I guess we will keep as well. Matt Picar is of the unearthed tier, so thank you so much, Matt. And then, if you can believe it, we have two, count them two, of the Veil tier supporters that are brand new. That is the very highest tier of support. Rob Orndorf and Vladislav Yorenka. Doing my best with your name there, my friend. Thank you so much to everybody who has supported this content down the years, especially our newest ones, and especially those of the Veil tier ones. You absolutely love to see that, and that is a beautiful thing. Now, our opponent has just spreading seized themselves to fix their own land. Very, very interesting. Um, I, I could lie and say that I played Bloodstain Meyer first to play around spreading seas, but i got to be honest, it was not on my radar. So I think I'm just going to cast... Well, if this was a Thought Seize that we just drew instead of Inquisition, I would definitely cast Kroxa here, I think. But with Inquisition, you know, they could play Teferi. They could play Narset. They could play all kinds of bad stuff, right? So even though it's not quite as mana efficient as going Kroxa would be, I think that's what we've got to do. Wow! Opponent on all the Spreading Seas. And they also don't naturally have the third land. I think we have to take a Spreading Seas. 
Jeez. <laughs> okay, then. Wow. So we're against blue-white control, leaning into spreading seas. So the opponent is obviously going to seize our land here. Oh, no, they're not. They just ripped the third land. Fair enough. Not gonna. F I'm going to be disciplined with the bolt here. Not going to fire it off in a response or anything like that. And we've drawn Dark Confidant. That's an interesting draw. That is an interesting draw indeed. I think we're going to cast a Kroxa here, see what they do, and then maybe, just maybe, unearthing the Kroxa makes sense. Because every card in their hand is pretty good. So one Teferi goes down, and then will they pitch Path, Seize, or Force? They're going to pitch Force. Makes sense. All right. <clears throat> Opponent gets to bounce the Spreading Seas. Yeah, that's really rough. Wow, is that rough. Okay, so we're kind of locked out of black for the foreseeable future. And we draw red. Dang. Not good. Not good. Not good. All right, well, let's bolt Tef. And they have ripped Batter Skull in the fifth land. Man. Oof. Okay. Thankfully, we have found a swamp, but the timing of this is pretty bad, isn't it? Uh, the timing of, of them drawing so well, that is. Uh, so one option here, I mean, every card in our hand is technically an option. I'm probably not going to cast another Kroxa yet. Probably also not quite supposed to cast Bob. I think now's an okay time to ransack the lab. All right, Lightning Skelemental is intriguing. But I think we just have to take the Marsh Flats. Plan to escape Croaks and, and win that way, hopefully. It's going to represent a nice X for one in our favor, and we do have another backup one in hand. It's going to be real tough to deal with this germ, though. With them having made all these land drops, it's going to be pretty easy for them to hold up ways to bounce it. Ooh, we are a little punished for taking the flats because we're just going to draw Swamp anyway, apparently. That's all right. Let's escape Kroxa. Leaving a Skelemental around. So Crox is going to get pathed, one imagines. But again, still a nice X for one in our favor. Okay, we're out of basics. Oof, now we flood, eh? All right, well, let's lead on another Kroxa. At least these lands are fetch lands, so we're filling up the graveyard a little more quickly. Opponents flooded too, but... Let's see if they have a piece of permission as their last card in hand. They do not seem to. Okay, then. <clears throat> oh, Stoneforge Mystic. Big yikes. Big yikes. Okay, so Blue-White Stone Blade with Spreading Seas. They go get Sword of Feast and Famine. Makes some sense.
Will they hard cast it? No. Lightning Bolt Liliana of the Veil, huh? Very, very interesting here. So, let's see. We bolt the Stone Forge. We then kind of probably have to edict with the Liliana, right? This is all assuming they don't have permission. Because otherwise, like, if we just like escape Kroxa, they picked whatever else is in their hand, then they're casting Feast and Famine. We can't really allow that, so... So let's begin with a bolt here. I think no matter what else we do, that's probably the play. Now, so we could fetch and shock. We still wouldn't, We well, no, we would have enough black. But going to two with Bob around seems pretty bad, right? We're just dead on board if we don't need it. Okay. I'll scoop to that. We're technically not dead because we can block. Uh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. The whole time I was imagining a world in which we are able to deal with a creature and not get sorted this turn, we are dead because they have protection from black. Uh, pretty rough there, but yeah, opponent's curve out was decent. Their, their opening hand was like it had a fail rate, and they just naturally drew that third land and then went off from there. Um, I don't know if we could play any differently around the Teferi bouncing their own spreading seas with two Teferis in hand. I don't, don't really think so, but I'd need to look back at that. Anyway, um, Boyle is actually kind of risky here because, as you see, they are showing us some non-island lands, and they're going to be seizing our lands, so I actually don't think we're supposed to play it. I think attacking their land base with Pillage is actually pretty good, though, especially because it can hit uh, Stoneforge Mystic Tutor targets. Similarly, Angrath's Rampage seems pretty good here. Uh, it can take care of the artifacts or the creatures or the Planeswalkers. Seems definitely good. Um, I'm going to play Ashiok and probably a Spellbomb. You could see playing like a Brutality or two as well. I don't think we need the full complement of Spellbombs or the full complement of Brutalities. And again, I am leaving Boyle on the bench. So can we fit all of these cards in? Well, I think Unearth is pretty bad. We could play one to buy back after permission and or to cycle. I think cutting two is pretty good, though. We're going to cut the pushes and lean into other things to kill Stoneforge Mystic. Dreadbore. Hmm. Yeah, I don't want to get caught with, like, too much removal. It's nice that Dreadbore and Rampage are modal, but... Maybe we only play with, like, one Brutality. I think that's fine. I'm going to trim around the edges here. No Unearth, cut a Bolt. And then uh, I don't really want to cut a land on the play when we are still only playing 22. So maybe, like, only one Angrath's Rampage is fine. We've got, like, a hedged techie post side deck. And I don't, I don't know how this matchup's supposed to be. That was a pretty cool... Game one, but we did get beat. And I guess it wasn't especially close. I'll keep this. Turn three planeswalkers on the player pretty good. Let's 
Let's run out of wooded foothills, because if they just kind of do nothing, maybe we cling our own thing to draw, but I'm not sure if that's correct. I don't think I will just yet. Okay, Dreadbore in hand actually seems kind of good, uh, at least potentially. Because if we're like on the Liliana plan and they can't necessarily answer her or stop her from doing her thing, but maybe they can land a Planeswalker of their own. We might struggle to beat it, but Dreadbore can potentially get that done for us. So the, do they have the spreading seas for us? They sure do. All right, I think it is now incumbent upon us just to draw cards, so let's just cling this land. Yep. Oh, we've drawn Lightning Skelemental. Sure, that's going to be the play. That is going to be the play. Now, if they have another Seize, that's just rough. But I don't think that's a reason to stop us from playing a 3-drop here. Oh, I'm sorry. I take it back. The demands of Lightning Skelemental are so intense that we actually cannot quite cast it. So, for that reason, it could be a pretty interesting pitch target. It'd be a shame to, but realistically, I actually think I'm supposed to here. Even if we draw a land next turn, it is arguably just as good to double spell. So that spreading the spreading sea is really hurting us. Spreading sea served as a disruption and draw engine for the opponent in game one, and it's doing the same here in game two for sure. Um, now one reason to have pitched something besides Skelemental, like maybe Lightning Bolt, would be if we do expect them to go to Fairy, bounce the seas, Maybe that unlocks like a Thought Seize Skelemental turn next turn, which would be kind of cool if we draw the fourth land. Or if we don't, just lets us play Skelemental. Yeah. Spreading Seas. Wow. D Sphere. Okay. Okay, okay, it's looking kind of rough for us. Seems like the opponent's specific build has a lot of tools uh, for what we're trying to do. So, um, we have not drawn the fourth land. We've drawn a card that doesn't do much right now, but could be good in the future. But with our hands so full of answers, I don't feel a pressing need to Thought Seize. And I will therefore play Ashiok. And I'm actually going to mill myself here. Exile the opponent's yard. Maybe we're shutting off fetch lands or Stoneforge Mystics or other things. We've drawn a pillage, huh? We've drawn a pillage, huh? Well, I think I'm just going to go for it. Try to pillage the Hallowed Fountain. Again, in conjunction with Ashiok, this could make some sense. Shark Typhoon. Got it. All right, not activating Ashiok here. I 
Nashiak will draw the attack as expected. Opponent with a prismatic vista that they cannot crack in the face of Ashiok. Ourselves with a ransack the lab. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So I actually really want to make sure the shark dies. So I think we, instead of going ransack, which seems really good, um, or instead of just casting like a dread or a rampage, again, the seas is stopping us from double spelling. It's really rough. Um, we are probably supposed to go Thought Seize into Bolt. Missing the fourth land for this long has been pretty bad, gotta say. All right, so they have Batter Skull, which we can answer with Angraf's Rampage. Path to Exile we don't care about yet. Stoneforge Mystic Search is shut off, so let's just take Big Teth. Bolt the Shark and say go. Will they path it? No. Okay. OP playing a stone forge mystic, getting the search shut off. Ashiok, OP, and they've drawn a land. Oh, Ashiok, we love you so much. Alrighty. So. Begin by casting a ransack the lab here. Collective Brutality, and we actually have kind of caught them with the inability to path. Is that even any good? Um, to escalate the Brutality? Probably not. So do we even want to take it? Probably. At this point, we probably just take a spell, even though like using a land is okay. So yeah, let's take the Brutality. Just use that as a kill spell for Stoneforge Mystic. Gonna keep Ashiok around. They haven't shown us much out of the out of the graveyard yet. We can now cling. And we've just drawn a land anyway. Cool. Okay. Um I don't really think it matters what we get rid of. Hmm. Actually, just gonna say go here. Whoops, that was bad. Didn't realize we were totally out of fetchables. That's really unusual this stage of the game, but didn't pay close enough attention to what we had milled with Kroxa. Okay, there is a Lightning Skelemental, so it's going to get pathed, but... I guess we'll wait a turn on that. Just keep clinging stuff away, all right? We found Croak, so let's lead there. It's possible they path it. Just so we cannot escape it next turn. But they don't. Okay. Um, so now I think we just slam Skelemental. Force them to answer this this turn and Croak's the next turn, right? Okay. 
Okay, OP with another shark typhoon. We get Path and Snow Covered Island out of the hand. Interesting. I don't know if what to make of opponent sequencing, frankly, but they're going to get to finally beat our Ashiok, who's been MVP here. And a field us. We do have a swamp. And there's our Liliana, huh? Hmm. Getting behind on the clock, so I'm just going to make some plays pretty aggressively here. Not thinking too, too much about them. So there is still game three to worry about. Okay, Kroxa draws out the cryptic. That's more value positive for us than losing an actual spell from hand, right? OP with Stoneforge Mystic. Going to get fire and ice. Going to equip it. Feels bad, man. Feels so bad, but we've got outs. One, two, three, four, five, six lands. One of which is an island for us if we draw a land, which we don't. Okay. Um... Thought sees Rampage, and then either Dreadbore or Liliana, sure. Nice. You sack an artifact. And then we'll just Dreadbore the shark, I guess. Quite the turn. Liliana Edict there would have been fine as well. It's kind of 50-50. If they top deck a Planeswalker, we get punished. They top deck Castle Ardenvale. That could help get them over the line, to be sure. All right. Uh, so we could actually go Liliana and Skelemental, but we better escape Kroxa here. I think that's a little better overall. One, two, three, four, and then we get one Skelemental gone, sure. Castle Ardenville is really good at this stage of the game. This has been a really interesting match. Ooh, opponents top deck and more stuff. Something to main phase. Oh, Teferi! No, that's such a disaster. It is a disaster. Mm-hmm. Okay, but they play a land out. Oh, man. Oh, they're dead. They're dead. Here we go. Kroxa to deal three. Skelemental to deal six. GG. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Cancel, cancel. I stand corrected. They can make yet another blocker with Castle Ardenvale. Ah! Even though we trample, we're going to put them to one. They're going to kill us on the crackback. Alternatively, there is no alternative. We can't quite escape Kroxa. Yeah, we can't quite escape Kroxa. Liliana Edict, we're still dead on the crackback, so yeah, let's go for the Skelemental and make them see the block, right? All right, they got us. Man, that was okay. Alex, I know our previous league went two and three. I know that this was a loss to start things out, but maybe it's just me. I think that was a super cool game. I hope nothing I did 
changed the outcome there. But, you know, getting this far behind on the clock definitely felt the need to start playing a little bit more quickly. And, uh, hey, that was some good clean magic against a really interesting deck. But Spreading Seas uh, preventing us from double spelling so often throughout the, that game, uh, for, through both games, really, that brought into stark relief the extreme color demands of our deck. So normally it's not that big a deal, especially because we don't really play colorless lands. But in the context of this particular opponent and the particular card spreading seas, even changing one of our lands to blue or a virtual wastes in the context of our deck, with Kroxa, Skelemental, even stuff like Liliana, and the prospect of double spelling, it's actually kind of rough. But anyway, that was a close one. That was a fun one. On we go. Okay, on the play for round two. And we've got to keep for sure. If they play to the board, they're going to be in some trouble. If not, hopefully Inquisition can cripple them and Spyro can bridge us into the right half of the deck. So one thing I did, because we were, like, we were exactly taking lethal in round one, um, that might have cost us the game was just fetching uh, when we... I guess I fetched with Wooded Foothills and I had a Swamp in the deck. Didn't look closely enough at that. Obviously that changes everything though because we're drawing entirely different cards if we don't fetch, right? So who knows, but maybe there was something I could have done differently that I'm thinking of now. In any case, on to the next one, and it is Explorer Summoner's Pact Azusa Dryad. Uh, so because they have Azusa and Dryad and a Summoner's Pact, I kind of want to take Explorer. Uh, still could take Pact, because that represents Titan. Um, but we could also take Explorer and hope they have some kind of a fail rate with not hitting the lands. You could go either way here. If I wish I had another discard spell or a Liliana, then I'd easily take the Explorer. Still might. Ah, uh, you know what? Like, our clock is so slow. Like, the only creature, the only threat we have is Spyro, so I guess we have to play for the long game by taking Pact. But that feels bad. The Explorer not only lets them see an extra card, it lets them make an extra land drop, which can make the Gruel Turf less clunky, but hey! Hey! The second discard spell is coming our way anyway, so now we're going to take the Explorer. Yeah. Because now, you know, they've drawn another land, making some of the Azusa Dryad kind of land combo-y stuff better, but at this point we also just have to try to control their ability to dig through the deck as best as we can. Black Cleave Cliffs, huh? All right, well, Spyro time. We'll get rid of Push and Flats, see two new ones, hopefully ones that are relevant in the matchup. Like, playing Marsh Flats there and holding the push was not the worst, but it still feels too dirtily, too reactive to me. Like, we need to get a board presence down, we need to start attacking. Like, allowing the Titan deck to make a bunch of land drops and then, like, kind of reactively killing their setup cards is not a very good winning strategy. We just have to give them as little time to top deck Titan as possible. Another Spyro, man. Hmm. Well, I don't think we're going to Dread Bore Azusa. I'm going to get greedy here, play for a higher upside. Pitch two lands. Okay, Castle Lock Thwain Unearth. OK, 
Okay, not finding the right half of the deck, we needed to find more discard effects, a Liliana. Lightning Skelemental would have been the best find, most likely. They're continuing to draw land, so there's a second Garen Brig and a Cavern of Souls. Or did they... Did they do Azusa? Or <laughs> Azusa. Vesuva, Azusa. Potato, potato. There's the Vesuva. For Castle Lock Thwain, how spicy. But they won't be able to activate it once we Dreadbore the Dryad. And therefore, we do probably have to do that. The draw of a third Spyro, it's kind of uh, like chaining them together can be good. But, you know. This, again, is like the nut draw in a grind fest. Against the big mana deck, not really getting it done. Most likely, but if we just fade the Titans for long enough, then it still could. Who knew Azusa could ever be a good blocker, but she's holding back the Knight. She's holding back the Elemental here. We are likely going to just cycle the Unearth on the Unstep. There is a world in which hanging on to it makes sense, but probably not. There's our Skelly. There it is. That's a good one. OP hesitating on our upkeep. I don't know why. Maybe nothing game related. Okay, Black Cleave Cliffs. Here comes that Skelemental, and the opponent just lets it all through. Nice. So, a casual deal six, discard two against the big mana deck, obviously real nice. We get Pact of Negation and Gruel Turf out of the opponent, and they play Field of the Dead, which is too little too late. Uh, most likely. They're not quite dead on board, but they have to block, chump block with Azusa, go to one, and we have a Spyro in hand, and maybe we'll just draw lethal. Or maybe Spiral will loot us into, or will draw us into lethal. <clears throat> Again on the upkeep, OP. Come on. Come on, we gotta go fast. We're the big mana deck. <laughs> You're the big mana deck. We're the, the red rock deck. We gotta go fast. Uh, Spyro, number three. Why not? Lightning Bolt. Well, let's do it more stylishly. We're going to bolt Azusa. Attack over the line with the with the ground forces for a comprehensive game one win against Titan, which is just why this deck is so appealing, right? If you're used to playing The Rock, if you're used to playing Jund, Abzan, we do have our tools against Big Mana, and we're about to get some better ones with Zendikar Rising, but... Still, there's nothing quite comparable to this, to the Red Rock plan involving cards like Lightning Skelemental. Very good. But opponent will hesitate a while here before conceding. I guess I'm going to get up for a second. Be right back. Okay, I have returned. Opponent has returned, and the victory is secured. Ashiok, Pillage, possibly Boil, um, Angrath's Rampage, maybe. Hitting Amulet, hitting a creature for two mana seems reasonable enough. Uh, it's probably all we're doing. Do we play Necromentia? I don't know. We'll put it in the maybe category. We'll see exactly what needs to come out. Uh, Ransack the Lab is dirtily enough. Ditto Unearth. Probably going to cut pushes rather than bolts, especially if we're playing with Dreadbore and Angrath's Rampage, which I guess we are. 
Uh, Kling is just another cantrippy card like the others that we could move away from. I think as far as all of the like meat and potatoes of our deck is concerned, all the core threats and the core permanents like Liliana, they're all really good. So can we make six cuts from this and play fully sideboarded, including with an I win button in the form of Boil that might be high variance? Yeah, I think we can. So... Why don't we just leave a Ransack the Lab in and try to sideboard heavily, just if nothing else, to see what the new tech does for us. Yeah, even against this deck, I'm like feeling kind of meh about Necromentia, but maybe I am not correctly rating the card. I just like envision casting it, getting all the Titans out of there, and then losing to Field of the Dead, and we also will have made them a bunch of zombies along the way, right? Because that's what Necromentia's downside is. We'll see how it goes. All right, our hand is slow, but boy, is it strong. It's a definite keep, and I, it is a hand that'd be much better on the play. But to be fair, on the play, it's also less likely to draw the third land that we need in time. So we just have to hope they have like a somewhat dirtily keep, and we get to punish them for that. And we have hit the third land, so that's really nice right away. <clears throat> Okay, so far so dirtily for OP. So it's going to be Kroxa into Skelemental or Kroxa into Liliana as the case may be. Unless we draw something to change our mind, but so far we have not. I'm going to use one of these to fetch now. We'll save one. Use one. Kroxa. Just fuel, fueling the graveyard as much as we can for a potential turn for Groxa. Again, we'll see if that actually gets us there. We've also we could also cast Necromentia next turn. It's really hard to say. Again, our hand is really powerful, and if we were on the play, then it'd be really something. Because again, the only fail rate was us not hitting our lands. But since we've drawn runner runner land, being on the play would just be super oppressive. Okay, so we want to fade Azusa here. Okay, they have Dryad. Not as bad as Azusa, but still a little rough. Alright, so do we go Necromentia to get rid of all the Titans, and then try to take the game away from there? Or... Do we go for a higher upside play of Liliana or Skelemental? I think because they have a Dryad, we're probably not supposed to go Skelemental, especially because they still have four cards in hand. Like, they could, because Castle Garenberg is busted in half, they could just ha keep, like, a Greenland, or I guess any land, because it's Dryad, Plus Titan, discard the other two. So I'm thinking of either Lily or Necromentia. And Necromentia actually makes a subsequent Liliana or Skelemental worse. Because if we get Titans out of their hand, we're going to give them zombies. So I think I'm going to play Liliana Edict them. And hope they don't have Titan just naturally rolled up. And then next turn, this gives us kind of the widest variety of, of angles from which to decide to attack them, including the potential draw of a card like Thoughtseize. Or...
or unearth, which would open up some interesting lines with Liliana ticking up. But I think we cited out all three. Yes, we did cite out all three unearth, so that's fine. All right. Opponent tapping the lens many different ways and never satisfied with how it looks, so... Okay, another Dryad. Another land, at least one. There's Cavern. Oh, and then they're going to give it Haste? All right. Okay. I was just about to say, like, Lily plus one Skelemental gets them totally empty-handed. Oh, and they play a land, they play Valakut. All right, now we have to play Skelemental, right? Just get the last two cards out of their hand. It's just too good not to. And we have a couple answers remaining in the deck. Or remaining in the hand, rather, to the Dryad, including Liliana and Rampage. All right, so what have they been slow rolling here? Tireless Tracker and Gruel Turf. Wow. Okay, we are rewarded for that play in a major way. Again, this is kind of what I mean about Necromentia. Like, they have so many ways that they can beat a mid rangey deck that I'm... Not that high on it, even in the matchups where it's good. But I'm willing to certainly entertain other thoughts on the matter. If you guys have a good case for these, like, non-conditional 3-mana extraction effects, Necromantia, Unmoored Ego, whatever else, you can leave it in the comments below. Okay, opponent's drawn action. Sakura Tribe Scout. Well. Okay, here come the beats. Probably supposed to escape Kroxa rather than deal with their creatures, right? See what we draw, of course. As always, we gotta see what we draw. Black Cleave Cliffs, not very exciting. So, because Unearth is out of the deck, I think it's fine to just play Cliffs, hold the fetch land, and that's just more efficient for future turns. We have to get rid of Skelemental that way, but again, with Unearth out of the deck, I think that's fine. Okay, got to fade a bad top deck one time, and then we should be able to beat just about anything they're up to. Because Kroxa is really good. And you know these decks do play like Relic of Progenitus or whatever, so I did feel obligated to escape Kroxa, who is our only threat, before they could find such a thing. Okay, OP with a tracker. Well... The gas kind of keeps coming for them. We faded the big bombs, though. All right, ransack the lab. So one option is to kick it off with ransack and then Lily Edict, but they're just going to lose the scout. So we're probably supposed to just Lily Edict Angrath's Rampage. Like, we could get lucky with Ransack and draw Lightning Bolt or other targeted removal. 
but the fact that if we don't draw exactly a one drop, we can't double spell, that seems kind of bad. We also could play Necromentia to get rid of all the Titans. All right, let's go Lily Edict. Let's then attack and see how they block, right? Because they could be dead if they let this through to just a simple lightning bolt or Coligan's command or any number of things. They do just decide to let it through, huh? Okay. Well, now another option is, is uh, ransack the lab looking for a way to end the game now, which would just be Lightning Bolt. But I think our position is so strong that now it's time to Necromentia for Titan. I've never resolved this card before, so I'm going to read it one more time. Choose a card name other than a basic land card name. Search target opponent's graveyard, hand, and library for any number of cards with that name and exile them. Then they shuffle, and they won't get zombies because there's nothing coming out of their hand. So that's getting rid of their bomb top decks. But if they draw like a bounce land, we're punished for not edicting with Rampage because then they get to make a couple clues. They're playing a land, they're bouncing a land, they're playing another one because Dryad and Tracker are good together. So it is still a bit of a judgment call. Nonetheless, we came here to play the Spice. Let's play the Spice. Primeval Titan. And we get to look at the whole entire deck that way. And notables are Bajuka Bog. Two copies is total of Field of the Dead. Still all amulets in post side. There's a Reclamation Sage. Two more trackers, otherwise it's pretty usual stuff as far as I can see at a glance. Okay, so no more Titan for you. And that's the concession. All right, so I tank for a while on the final decision of the game. Maybe it proved to be the right one. We will never know. But either way, a drubbing of Amulet Titan, and that feels great after we kind of got drubbed in round one. Uh, yeah, again, Red Rock, this is kind of what it does. It's an aggressive, mid-rangey deck that can really put big mana to the sword. And Lightning Skelemental, Kroxa, the whole nine yards we had it here feels pretty good. Doing pretty well with the die rolls here, and it is round three. Let's see what we can do about our opening hand. What will we be dealt? We will be dealt a uh, one lander. I guess I tempted fate, and the one land is Castle Lock Thwain, Clear Mulligan. Uh, and we're against Alurus deck, so it's going to be six cards against their eight, but they mulligan, but we're going to have to go to five. It's another one lander with only black. Man. Oof. Feels so bad. Feels so bad, but this is a really good five. Um, we're going to keep and. Probably supposed to try to empty the hand and play a Spyro. So to that end, I'm going to bottom a Liliana and assume they're going to be on prowess. We could hope to, we could bottom a basic swamp, I guess, and hope to get lucky. Yeah, okay, I actually think that's good. Why don't we hope to get lucky because we already mulliganed to five against the companion deck. Thoughtseize, Fatal Push are both really good here. And we'll just have to draw the third land for a Spyro. That should be no problem, right? Indeed, it is Rakdos Prowess. They've got Double Abbot, Cling to Dust, Soul Scar Mage. 
Just gonna take one of the Abbots, then push the Soul Scar next turn, and try to out top deck them. Because right now they're they're beginning the game plus two on resources, maybe even plus three if you include them being on the draw. We've got a Kroxa. It's not a bad time for one. Actually, yeah, it kind of is. I'm just going to say go here. Because if we Kroxa, it's going to let them use Cling to Dust proactively as a way to grow Soul Scar Mage. And we don't want that. We also don't want to take any damage from SSM. Okay, they're showing us a land we don't know about. So maybe they will cling before damage. They won't. Okay. Too bad. Okay, OP just playing it slow as they should in this spot. Us with the draw of Bloodstain Mire off the top, you'll love to see it. So now we get to go Spyro pitching Kroxa, which is not ideal, but I still like kind of getting out ahead of them. Obviously, they get to trade their Kling for Kroxa, but hey, we do get a token out of the deal, and we're seeing two fresh cards, and just doing this as soon as possible rewards our deck, and the presence of Lightning Skelemental is very nice. So... Uh, this could have gone better for us if the opponent tried to shove a little more damage through with Cling to Dust, uh, but they were more disciplined than that. They're going to lead off on Abbott. They find another Cling. Ooh, that's a good find, because we know they have the land in hand. However, they are incentivized to just do that right now. And I was just about to say it, it guarantees our Skelemental can two-for-one them, but it doesn't because they had a free spell to play in the form of Bobble. So things are getting a little... We're getting a little punished here, but Skelemental's still going to smack him for six and get the Abbot out of the hand, right? The big problem, as always, with these decks is the companion just waiting in the wings. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Skelly is going to still get two out of their hand in a couple different ways. I just totally misread that because they draw off the cling and they draw off the bobble. Duh. Hello, duh. Anyway. Bad news for us is we're just kind of flooding out. You can't afford to flood after you've mulled the five against the companion deck, I hate to say. Sad but true. I'm going to shove with Skelemental and Elemental. Um, Pyro might be able to block Abbott next turn, or at least represent a block, forcing them to have two pieces of action. And since we're getting them down to one card here, that might be a big ask. We get Sunbay Canyon Monomorphos out of the hand. Definitely a couple of pieces of action. But they do still have that Abbott. <clears throat> I think this is a bad matchup. The opposing deck grinds really well, and we don't necessarily do that well against the red deck wins variants. Lightning Skelemental was pretty good there, but broadly is a bad card in the matchup. Okay, Monomorphos is one thing the opponent could have to... Freely attack into Spyro here. Looks like that's the plan, but... They do still need another follow-up, and... You know, like, throwing a chump block here is not the end of the world. Just because we can always buy back the Pyromancer. I'm not sure if we're supposed to do that. Our life total's pretty high. Wow, and uh, Bobble and Seal of Fire. Sheesh. Sheesh! All right. OP just going to town on us here. All right, let's draw Unearth. 
Let's begin with a one mana season pyromancer with an empty hand. That's what we need to do. That's how we outgrind this deck. Getting finding a Kroxa would be really good too, just because it's something that maybe would be too big for them to handle and outgrind. Instead we draw Blood Crypt for a turn. Yeah. Okay, not gonna get there this time. Feels bad. Mulda 5 followed by the Flood. It's kind of deterministic against a companion deck keeping a good 6. I hate to be that way about it, but I think it's kind of that way. He loading up the hand with Luris. We'll make our tokens. And we'll draw another land. Alright, I concede. Way too much flooding against what they were up to. Hate when it comes down to that, but... Not much we can do. All right, Collective Brutality times three. Angrath's Rampage times two, yeah, yeah, it's okay. Sorcery Speed, two mana, Edict, not the best, but definitely fine. Nile Spellbomb's good. Don't think we want anything else. Plague Engineer and Ashiok could be better than bad cards in some configurations, but I doubt that will be the case for us. We're going to cut Dark Confidants. We're going to cut two of our three Thought Seizes. You could cut the third. Maybe I will. Maybe I won't. We'll see. We'll see. Um, probably just going to leave it in and play with, like, two Lightning Skelemental. That sounds about right. Looks pretty good to me. Uh, the matchup, I think, is going to be just kind of bad, but there are many, many progressions we do have that can get there. I think they depend on, like, trading efficiently and winning with Kroxa. That's the clearest path to victory I see. Another no-lander. Okay, send it back. Okay, now we have all interaction as a six. Well, we're going to follow the same protocol as before. We're going to keep it. We're going to bottom a land... I think it'd be really bad to bring Blood Moon in, but keeping Bloodstained Mire allows us to get a Swamp to play around Blood Moon and also allows us to fill up the graveyard, but it comes at the cost of taking an unnecessary point of damage and also potentially stopping us from casting Skelemental and Pyromancer. You know, if we draw a third land and those cards, but the third land we draw is Castle Lock, Thwain, or Swamp. So I think I'm going to bottom the fetch land. And with double Inquisition, we shouldn't lose to a, a bad Blood Moon anyway, right? So, you know, despite the mulligan and there they didn't maul, I might be feeling okay if it wasn't for a companion, but they have companion. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. So, uh, they've got a lot going on. Just going to take their threat for now. Going to take the Abbot. There's like a consideration to taking Nile Spellbomb because it is the proactive thing to do in their hand on turn one. But they don't run it out. Or will they? Second main running out. Cuking us out. Got it. Okay. Thought Seize is the draw. So the discard's coming at the right time. That is for sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll use a Thought Seize now just for the sake of mana efficiency. We don't strictly have to, but I think I will. So we got to keep one of these Brutalities in the back pocket to kill Luris, even though Luris is a long way away. So let's just draw... we got to draw threats now. And we kind of need to draw more lands to make the threats good, so... Even though we had a really good T1 into T2... Oh, dang, OP rips Kroxa! 
that's so bad for us. That completely punishes us for everything we've done so far. And that's a card we probably can't beat. So now we need to rip, like, Nile Spellbomb. Ransack the lab. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Lightning Skelemental, Cling to Dust, Marsh Flats. Uh, take the Cling. That's something that allows us to beat Kroxa, but at the cost of card disadvantage. Because when we exile a creature, we don't get to draw off of it. The life gain is definitely not nothing, but it's not really where we want to be right now, having mulliganed. Opponent shows us a land we didn't know about, so their hand is still Fatal Push Bloodstained Mire. I guess we should be able to respond to something... Like, they need another card in the graveyard to escape Kroxa, so no matter how they put one in, whether it's activating Spellbomb or cracking a fetch land, we should be able to respond with the Cling to Dust. Therefore, we don't need to do it now. If we do it now... Okay. So they're going to do this now, which is exactly why we waited, is as I was getting around to saying. And we're going to let that resolve... And then we're going to move to their upkeep in case they drew a cling. Not that they'd probably compete over this anyway, but on the upkeep before the draw is the optimal time to cling the Kroxa. And of course, we let that resolve so that our cling is going to stay around in the graveyard after their spell bomb. So a little, you know, some nice, a nice thing happening for us, but we're so far behind. We're so far behind. OP with an Abbot of Carol Keep into Cling to Dust. Man, their draws have been really oppressive in light of our being behind on the mulligans. We are we're like we're like five cards behind right now. It's insane. And like that more almost than the aggro dimension is why this is a bad matchup. But the aggro dimension doesn't help because they can turn the corner out of nowhere and because their red spells line up well against us. All right. Well, I'm going to Brutality to Escalate. Kill the Abbot. Take the Fatal Push. But... Now we have no answer to Luris, and they have found a spell bomb, so whenever they feel like it, it's going to be buy back the, or load the Luris into hand, then start going to town. And even without that, they're still going to be two cards ahead of us with a fuller graveyard and more lands on the field. And there's a Coligan's command in their hand. Well, new plan, let's take that away <laughs> instead of the fatal push. You know, I really like playing against the Prowess decks but specifically against Companion. It's just so punishing if you mulligan and you're on an attrition deck, right? If we don't mulligan, or if they mulligan equal to us, okay, fine. But the point is, I, I still really dislike playing against Companion. Even though it's been nerfed and it's not that many actual Companions are registered any longer. Uh, Black Cleave Cliffs, I'm going to concede. Uh, the determinism of Luris is too much. We cannot come back. So, feels bad. Uh, I don't think there's anything differently we could have done at all. We just mulligan away some bad ones, and Prowess is going to get us. Uh, this variant of Prowess is definitely going to get us. Mono Red and Is It. There are ways where, despite card disadvantage, we can still um cripple their plan enough but that's what i was getting around to saying that's why i really hate the design of companion uh in a game where variance is huge it takes so much variance away from only one player all that said i think rakdos prowess is still a pretty healthy top deck to have in the format and i really need to play it i just don't have the time it's just always donation leagues and the rest of my life keeping me too busy to do so but 
Some people have asked me lately, are you going to play Rakdos Prowess? Yeah, as soon as I get a chance to do so. So you saw the power of the deck there. Unfortunately, we kind of lost to our own deck here. But what are you going to do? Let's go on to round four. Well, we can't complain about the die rolls. I believe we won all four. And this opening hand, if it draws the third land, it's kind of nutty. If it doesn't, it could go nowhere fast. But it's an absolute, definite, guaranteed keep. And we are not against a companion. So there's that. This hand could, like, actually beat a companion hand, though. You know what I mean? Anyway, opponent will keep seven. Thought sees you. Okay, it's a one land shadow keep. Cling to dust the you, now ubiquitous cling. And they have one threat in the form of shadow. And then they have a bunch of free or cheap stuff. Fatal push, street wraith, SWD, thought scour. A classic shadow hand that's going to be a little bit tough for us to beat. Um, I think we're supposed to ignore stubborn denial for now. So we could take one of the cantrips away, or we could just take Shadow away. Probably just supposed to take Shadow. Uh, we cannot answer it. And we're clearly, our hand is pointing us toward an aggressive plan with Double Skelemental and Lightning Bolt. Cards that are very high variance in the matchup. Man, can you imagine if we were against so many other decks uh, with this hand? It would be really tough for them to keep up with. As it is, we could still kind of put Shadow Lights out with this hand. On the other hand, it could just, like, our stuff could just really not line up against Shadow. Our hand is very high variance against the deck we're, that we're facing right now. But we have drawn the third land, so that is awesome. That's really, really good. Okay, so OP shocking in to Thought Scour, one assumes, and uh, now we just gotta fade a good old Gurmag Angler. Maybe they won't have a fetch land, so maybe they won't be representing Fatal Push. I mean, if we could fade a second land and an Angler, we'd be really lucky. They do have a second land, but it's not fetch. They're gonna shock it in. Then they're just going to pass. Well, this could be really good for us, guys. Like I said, high variance hand for us. If the opponent doesn't have the right stuff, they could be in big trouble. We draw Inquisition. Okay. Probably going to be good, but I think we just commit to Skelemental this turn. Make them beat it. They don't have an obvious way that they're representing to beat it. Even something like Drown in the Lock is not live. Maybe they have Dismember. Or they're going to cling. Okay. Looking for Dismember? Or just clinging to help them cur themselves curve out and discard in the least painful way? Skelemental looking good this league. Okay, so Kling is out of the hand. I guess Street Wraith is out of the hand, too. So right now there are four unknowns. Push goes down, so does their Inquisition. So their hand is going to be now four unknowns once they draw, plus a stubby D. Still really scary, but having this Inquisition in the back pocket, pretty cool to help beat that. They found Shadow... And Shadow. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, that's really bad. Well, that's really bad. Okay. Draw of Lock Thwain's pretty good, I guess. Let's Inquisition the opponent, right? Huh. Hold on. Cancel, cancel. Okay. I mean, if they have a Street Wraith, we're just kind of dead. But what do we think about attacking with Skelemental? 
forcing a shadow to trade with it. It's actually kind of good, right? Or if they let it through, we just bolt them and win. Yep. So if they have Street Wraith, we're, we're done for. But with no other way to engineer a trade with a shadow, I think we're supposed to do this. I don't really love the idea of like Inquisition into Spyro because then we're losing our ways like Skelemental and Bolt to steal the game. And I don't think we're winning like a grindy game at this stage with them having found double shadow. Okay, nice. Skelemental trading off with a shadow. Is there anything it can't do? That's really good. And now we get to Inquisition. And now our Spyro is going to be better next turn. And they have Thought Seize, which I guess we kind of have to take now. That feels pretty bad, but we don't want to lose our Spyro at this stage of the game for sure. So yeah, we'll thought see we'll Inquisition the Thought Seize away. Their hand is push Stubby D, which on two blue black lands is a really bad two cards to leave them with, but whatever. But whatever. I think that's kind of what we had to do, right? Black Cleave Cliffs. That is unfortunate. So do we bolt them or do we turn the bolt into a token? I think we turn the bolt into a token and then also we can maybe draw a one drop spell and get rewarded for it. It's definitely a judgment call here. But like unearth would be would be a pretty great draw, right? They could obviously stub it, but that would draw the stub. Okay, so we've also now probably kind of time walked them. Like maybe the best they can do here is push an elemental. And they will. All right. See, this is a like a three for one in our favor with Spyro. Our draws off the top are like decent in a vacuum, but in practice, this game is like really, really going to be sharply decided in the next two turns. Like, we don't really have time to grind out advantages or set up things with Ransack the Lab. So... Yeah, I think I'm, think I'm taking the chump block here. Feels pretty bad, but... But what else are we really going to do in that spot, right? Thought Seize. Seems good. Begin there. Okay. There's the stub. So then we'll go ransack the lab. Do they have another stub? Okay, so we can take... We're not going to take a land. We can take another Ransack and then bin Kroxa. Or we can just take Kroxa, play it, and then escape Kroxa next turn. Um... Hmm. I think I'm going to take the Croaks and use it because it seems kind of likely to get the stub out of their hand and that could make other draws good next turn. Also, just the draw of a land next turn, we could double spell with Croaks and Bob. So I don't think like we strictly need Ransack to set anything up. I'm going to take the Croaks here. This is, uh, this is another great game. 
Win or lose, this is a pretty awesome game if you ask me. OP's got a Street Wraith in the back pocket to cycle. Okay. There are now some things that we're going to be dead to. Such as them finding a land. Fair enough. Okay, so the Street Wraith as the one unknown in hand really punishes us for that. That's pretty unfortunate. Maybe somebody more experienced with Shadow would have seen that where I didn't. Right now, though, my instinct is that that is not an incorrect play. Um, I think even if, you know, somebody is more alert to that than I was, I think you probably still make that play anyway, but you guys let me know. Just lately, just lately, it seems like those tiny little outs that decide the games have been all going against us. But the match is young. Uh, losing game one sucks, though, right? Losing game one does really suck because a lot of our stuff is high variance. And I don't know overall how to rate the matchup, but we just certainly have a lot of good things to do. I think I'll play Ashiok on the play. Uh, Spellbomb, Rampage, both great. Plague Engineer is okay. I'm going to move away from the bolts. I don't know how many Skelementals should be in post side. Let's kind of put them over here in a three drop category along with the Plague Man. You could trim a bob here. Everything else is looking good, but moving away from a couple discard spells is like okay. Yeah, I like everything else a lot. So do we want to just get more threat heavy like this on the play? I kind of do. Is there room for, like, a cheeky boil or a pillage plan? I'm probably not going to do that, but maybe there could be. Yeah, why don't we just leave all this stuff in, and then we just trim one of our th threats that are a little more questionable. It should probably be a three-drop, and let's just play with only one Plague Man. We'll do all the really proactive high-ceiling stuff on the play, and then we'll readjust post-side once we take them to game three, if indeed we manage to. Okay, hand looks really solid. We're going to keep it. Inquisition into Bob, hopefully clearing the way for Bob to stick and for Bob to draw us the third land on curve for Liliana. We've got a backup Bob. We've got an Unearth. We've got Castle Lock Thwain as Flood Insurance. There is a lot to like. They have Thoughtseize, Push, Shadow. Mm-hmm. Well, I think we take the Thoughtseize because we don't want them to know the contents of our hand. Or to take the Liliana, but unless they just, like, draw another removal spell for a turn, maybe their Thoughtseize would have been priced into taking a Bob anyway. I'm not certain. Angrath's Rampage. Sure. So... We'll try a Bob. Bob's going to get pushed. And I think that's overall fine for us as long as the as long as we hit the third land Natty or the second Bob sticks. Or even if we draw like a one mana discard spell so we can go discard into Unearth it next turn. As long as we don't draw more Clunk, this will be fine. Even if we draw more Clunk, we have a very powerful hand in the opponent will have to draw pretty well to punish us for this and to, like, give us not much of a chance here. Like, I think our position's still pretty decent. And, you know, like, even playing Liliana on curve, like, it's always good. Oh, opponent just untaps. Interesting. 
Let me make sure I'm tracking the hand correctly. They're just letting us untap with Bob? Wow, okay. Didn't expect that one, but maybe they're like, well, they left our fatal push in hand, they must not value the Bob let that highly, let's let them have it, but... Oh, still no third land. Still no third land. What a tilt. I'm just going to main phase cling their thought sees. Looking for more action. All right, we have drawn an Inquisition. Still no third land, but at least Inquisition is something. We'll attack first. You know, it's not even clear that we're absolutely supposed to attack, but they're all the way at 20. Sure, we've got all the removal in hand. Then we I OK. Will this now draw a fatal push? Do they have stubborn denial? Who knows? They're just going to let it through. Wow. OK. They just have all lands in hand. So even though we've got all the answers, I actually think I'm still going to take Shadow. Because I don't mind them pushing this Bob so much with the contents of our hand. I think just like if we keep answering their threats, we can't lose, to state the obvious. Opponents just flooded to hell and back right out of the gates. Feels bad. Surely now they will push our Bob, though, right? Surely with us clearly not hitting the third land, they're going to try to stop us from doing that. That's got to be their route to victory at this stage. They're let, I don't know, I don't know why they're letting us on tap with Bob. And we're rewarded for it because there's Black Cleave Cliffs. Love to see that. Anyway, we'll take it. Okay, so as good as Liliana is, don't really want to walk her into the stub. I think we're going to play Spyro here, pitching the second Bob and one Unearth. We've still got an Unearth around to Unearth the Bob that we do pitch. We've still got Angrath's Rampage, Liliana, two fresh ones in hand. Seems like a really good spot. Okay, only two lands off of it, though. That's a little... That's just the little... They're starting to get a little frightened of that. The flood potentiality is there. Opponent's still doing nothing on the end stuff. If you're watching at home, I, I really think pushing the Confidant is the, is the play. Like, the Bob Triggers just aren't going to kill us. <laughs> They're just not. Okay, there's an Ashiok, sure. Begin with an attack. We don't have any instant speed removal if they're like gonna flash in a snapcaster to block or whatever, so be it. They're gonna bolt the Spyro. Wow. That's really good for us. <laughs> That's really good for us. Because now I believe we know their full hand still. No, 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 there's one unknown. All right, so let's lead off on Lily to play around a soft stub. And then we just get to unearth season Pyromancer. I'm not going to bother with the Ashiok this game. That'll be something we loot away to Spyro for a token and for fresh cards.
what a progression we are having. Despite missing the land for an unusual amount of top decks. That's the concession. All right. A very comprehensive win against a Flooding Shadow opponent there in Game 2. Um, again, I think they should have pushed the Bob pretty clearly to me, but maybe we have them kind of living in fear of Lightning Scale Elemental. Uh, and that's definitely something we could leverage, but the card, along with some other things like Ashiok, does get worse on the draw. But these are two cards that they're going to be playing around, having seen them. Actually... We didn't get to loot away the Ashiok, so maybe they don't know about that. Anyway, why don't we at least bring back a Plague Man and an Inquisition? I'm going to be a little leery of my life total. Leave the thoughts he's on the bench because they're playing Bolts. Uh, and because they're going to let our Bobs live, apparently. So <laughs> we gotta we got to hedge with our life total. And... I'm going to cut either two Skellies or a Skelly and an Ashiok. Not quite certain. Yeah, I don't know. Like, if we're having a certain progression, the Skelemental's better. If we're playing more of an interactive go-long game, Ashiok could be better. But I think I'm going to lean on... I'm going to err on the side of Skelemental. I wish we just had, like, a third Fatal Push to play over either. That'd be kind of cool. Not that that should necessarily be in our sideboard, but... Like, I wish we had a clearly great card to play instead of deciding between those two. Hmm. Is this hand keepable? Man, I really wish they would mulligan when we were dealt a 5-lander. Our hand is just so slow. But, like, mulling against the Shadow deck is so bad. And, like, we are a little immune... Like, we're not really immune to discard, but they have to have two discard spells for them to beat the Unearth Spyro combo. And if they have double discard and a good progression, then mulling to six is a disaster, too. Hmm. We're going to keep trying to get lucky. I am I am gun-shy with the mulligans after round three. Just the mull is, like, deterministically losing us the games. So we're going to keep. We're going to get lucky. That's the plan. Are you ready to keep and to get lucky? All right. Opponent, we're also giving ourselves a fjord out here. The opponent is going to thought seize the Spyro, and then we're just going to turn one unearth it. Dang, they don't. All right. Fjord out didn't work. GG. All right, let's... Eh, Dark Confidant, sure. At this point, like any... Any non-land, I'm going to be like, sure, good. We can, we can do something with that. The Shadow matchup is in so many ways just about resource advantage when you're the mid-range deck. Like, that's why, yes, we can get punished for a keep like this, but that's why I think the keep is more justifiable than it perhaps may appear. And look, exactly as predicted, the opponent's got a double discard opening progression, so you just can't win. Like, the Malda 6 is a disaster against that. Keeping the high land count 7 is also very bad against that. So we just have more resources to work with this way. Hopefully it'll be good enough. They haven't played a threat yet. We've got that going for us. And look at our draw of another Spyro. Let's go. Let's go. All right. We might still be in it. Do they have push? And if so, will they push the Bob this time? Paying costs. Oh, dismember. They're going to dismember the Bob. Yep. Okay, no discard, no threat, one turn. They're fetching. They're fetching. What makes them want to fetch? 
Gurmag Angler with Stubborn Denial back up is something that could make them want to fetch. Sadly, I believe that's what we're in for. Rough. Quite rough. Yes, indeed. Okay, well, Spyro can... Spyro can help us here. That is that is for sure. I'm so glad I've got his card locked and loaded, especially when we're drawing another land off the top. Yikes. Okay. Let's go get ourselves a mountain. Get rid of two fetch lands, see two new ones. We're still kind of in some trouble uh, because the anglers, I think, really tough for our deck to beat. If they have Stubby D, obviously that makes things a lot worse. Now, we do have a lot of outs to it, but they're like one for ones. Like uh, Dreadborer. Angrath's Rampage is an out to it right now. Liliana Edict is always an out uh, right now when they've got an otherwise empty board. Plague Engineer Lightning Skelemental. Well, how very interesting. Skelemental represents a way to potentially steal the game. Plague Engineer is a way to potentially trade with Angler. And notably, neither is stopped by the stub. So we have just given ourselves a couple of very interesting draws. I'm not going to take this block. Let's just draw... I don't know, like a discard spell would be pretty good. Ew, mountain. All right, so do we go for lethal? We just play Skelemental and say if you don't have, like, a kill spell, you're dead? Probably, right? Seems really good. I mean, maybe they could stay alive with, like, a cling to dust or something. But I'm going for it. Let's go. Faith in the Skelemental. Concession, Skelemental OP. Wow. All right. So felt really bad to lose that game one to exactly Street Wraith into land for our Kroxa to make their shadow exactly lethal. But we did get their post side, apparently leaving the third Skelemental in over the Ashiok, which would have been a terrible top deck in that situation, was rewarded. So it's worth thinking about those types of things for the future. And even though we're only 2-2 two and two right now, the results not setting the world on fire or anything, I think this league has been pretty cool to, uh, besides the mulligans against Prowess. I hope you guys feel the same. Alex, I hope you're liking it as well, my friend. And let's go try to cash. Uh-oh, we lose a die roll. We lose a die roll. GG. GG die roll. Uh, hand looks great, though, obviously, keeping it. Maybe it'll work out better that we're on the draw. Who knows? But yeah, four pieces of one drop interaction, two lands, and a bob seems really good. Well, on Earth's not interaction, but you understand. One drop action, let's put it that way. Okay. Opponent goes Bloodstained Mire, pass. Maybe it's Jund. We'll find out. Maybe it's the Mirror. Inquisition, you. Abrupt Decay, Cling to Dust, Lightning Bolt. Thinking about taking the Bolt here, like everything that Decay can hit, Bolt can hit, except Kroxa. So yeah, let's take the Bolt. It's also something they cannot fire off in response. If we draw, like, another discard spell next turn and just rip the whole hand to shreds. So opponent probably thinks it's a mirror. And in a couple ways it is, but in some important ways it is not. So we're going to try to really save our fatal push if possible for a goy for a scooze. Those are the... Green kind of mirror-breaking permanence in some ways. Hmm. A 
All right, Inquisition again. Maybe they will flood, and we can stick a bob. Nope, they're just drawing more removal, so it's decay or it's push. Once again, I think taking the one drop makes a little more sense here. Well, decay can hit Liliana. All right, this time we'll take decay, sure. I'm going to run out Marsh Flats because we're going to maybe juke them into thinking we're Mardu a little bit. We're also able to just grab a Painless Shockland or push something that they play on their turn. Uh-oh, they found a Liliana, huh? Looks like it. that's a really bad time for them to have found one. Oh, Spyro. Well, I guess that's probably worse than Liliana in some ways. So down goes two lands, probably. Yep. All right, not going to use my push on the Spyro. Grab a Blood Crypt. Untap and... Hopefully you get a heater off the top. Croxa, Liliana. There's Lily. Nice. All right. Yeah. E Lily, Edict, the Spyro's fine here. If they found, like, Land Blood Braid Elf, that's a disaster, but it's kind of always a disaster when we're on a mid-range deck against Jund. Lily is a good find, though. If we untap with her, it'll open up a lot of plays. If they have to spend removal on her, that's pretty fine. They've got Lily of their own, huh? All right, well, at this stage, I don't think the fatal pushes are going to survive to hit anything, so that's going to be my first pitch. We'll see if they pitch theirs as well. No, nope, it's a land. Then they play another one, so fatal push, we're going to get that out of their hand and stick a bob. A Spyro. Whoa. Okay. So what do we do here? What if we take up with Lily, pitch our mountain, then we... Can we do everything? Take up with Lily, pitch mountain, play Bob, unearth, season Pyromancer. Are you kidding me? <laughs> oh, that's so good. That's so good. All right. Just going to run it through one more time. Tick up with Lily, pitch the mountain. Two lands play a bob, one to unearth. Yep. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Um, the, the reason this was not making sense to me is because the Spyro is still in hand. I knew there was something I was missing. So what if we just pitch Spyro, play the mountain? Yeah, that's fine. That way we get another land drop down, too. Sure. It's at the end of a long league, and I've been talking a lot. Some obvious things can start to become a little bit... You can, like, a mental block can start to appear. Inquisition of Kozilek and Lightning Bolt. All right. The IOK is going to be Liliana Fodder at this point. Honestly, I want them to not have removal for Bob. I think that's like the most important thing to fade right now. Okay, they will Edict, down go Spyro. Then, uh-oh, Bloodbraid Elf? Really? Is that what you found? I mean, our draws have been good, too, so whatever. Looks like a Kroxa, but there's no Kroxa in the bin. Oh, they're going to cling Spyro main phase just to gain three life? Sure, I mean, I get it.
but it's not very value positive. Okay, and the, okay, because they get to play a land out. Sure, sure, I get it. All right, I'm going to be I'm going to be mono efficient here. We're going to bolt the lily. The important thing is we're untapping with Bob. The other important thing is we're untapping and taking up with Liliana. And then there's a lightning skeletal. All right, well I'm just going to get rid of the Inquisition here. I guess we'll play the Skelly just to hit him for six and dump the hand out, keeping it clear for Liliana and, importantly, for Castle Lock Thwain. The race is on. Okay, we got to fade the classic Jund top decks here. We are we are ahead, but don't want those to be famous last words, right? Opponent rips. Maybe cling to dust, maybe fatal push for one black. Remember they do have that cling still in the bin. Interesting. Maybe they were going to main phase the cling. Which I think they have some incentives to, so they could draw a bolt or push for Bob before we untap, but... Okay, we reveal a cling to dust. So now we can compete over their cling a bit, maybe? Uh, let's begin by taking up with Lily, getting rid of this Inquisition. We've drawn Inquisitions at some bad times, but it's good because there have been Lilianas around. Right? Baron Moore. All right, I mean, I don't think we have to make any first, any false moves here. We don't have to be the one to make the first move because we're the one with the pole position in regard to the board and the hand. <clears throat> wow, I compl I was worrying about the clings. I completely forgot about Spyro. That is my bad, guys. I might not have attacked if I'd seen that. That that was just sloppy, my mistake. Um, but it does open up an opportunity for us to cling their cling, which is pretty good. And we're gonna do that now, and get rewarded for it by finding a Kroxa. So now we have a new dimension on which to the to attack the opponent. And we're really rewarded because their cling could beat our Kroxa, but now it can't. So I'm not going to lie and say I had a 500 IQ vision from the future about all that transpiring. I did miss the uh, Spyro in the graveyard. However, we're rewarded. We got the squeeze on their life total. We got the Kroxa coming back next turn. Still got the Liliana around. Still got a cling to dust just like they did. And we still have Castle Lockthwain. All right, so they, they just attack and pass. We'll see what we draw, but it might be correct to take Lily up first just to beat, like, a Fatal Push in their hand and get the Kroxa stuck on the field. Um, because we've drawn a 2-drop, I'm not going to do that, because we can't cast it. So why don't we just escape the Kroxa instead? Uh, there's no unusual types in our graveyard. We'd want to do... Uh, well, okay. Let's get rid of Sorceries because they play Tarmogoyf, and that's what they don't have. So we'll get rid of all of our sorceries, and then just whatever. Okay, then I guess I'm just going to Edict the Token. I think that's fine. With a bob in hand, I don't want to tick up, and... 
leaving her alone against the Lightning Bolt deck when we could just instead clear the way for Kroxa. Swinging for lethal is probably pretty fine. Okay, if we move two attacks, I guess they're dead no matter what, right? We have not moved to attack, so they will terminate us. Fine. I accept, because they're still dead, because Kroxa is OP. They're dead to the Lava Spike mode of Kroxa. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, GG. Really nice to win game one against Jund. I think they're probably favored by a little bit. But we have some really swingy stuff that can put us over the line. Uh, and post side, yeah, I don't know what they're going to have for us necessarily. Specifically, probably nothing. Stuff that can come in from other matchups that it's there for to get us. Definitely some stuff, right? I think I like Angrath's Rampage and Nile Spellbomb. Probably not too much more. I don't like Ashiok against Jund. I don't really like Plague Engineer against Jund unless they're showing me, like, Bob and Hex Drinker, which they're not. I know it has Death Touch. It can trade with the Fatties, and I know it can beat the Spyro tokens, but that's not good enough to play a 3-mana 2-2, I don't think. So about these four cards coming in... Uh, Dark Confidant's pretty bad on the draw against Red and Six. And we could definitely side out a little bit of discard, too. Everything else looks pretty good. So what if we just, like, leave one Bob, try to find a good place for him? Run it somewhat like that. We could also side out a Bob for a Plague Man... We could, like, play a collective brutality and accept that it's going to be bad in some spots, but good in others. I don't think I like either of those plans. I think I like doing it like this. On the draw, feels a little tough here. A lot of our stuff loses some utility or some ceiling. But Inquisition, Croaks a Skelemental against a mulliganing opponent... I could get behind that. Okay. Seems good. Seems really good. So we want to fade them having a discard spell here. Well, they, they have the swamp, but they don't have the discard spell. All right. They have a two lander with no red. Fatal Push, Lightning Bolt, Lily Veil. So, Coligans, and a Coligans command, I don't, don't believe I said that. Um, pretty easy take to me of Lily, because any third land lets them play her, and she's really good. Whereas the K command right now, the big blood is if they can buy something back or kill something with it, and right now neither of those is true. So yeah, I guess we take the Lily. This could be a free win if they don't draw the red land. That is for sure. But, you know, uh, our opponent is displaying a similar principle to what we've displayed in that you're keeping, like, subpar hands rather than mull too deep in the attrition matchups. Well, we're starting to flood. That's not good at all. But we do have the free win potential. with a combination of our really powerful permanence and the opponent's potential struggles. Kroxa, turn two, getting a Coligan's command out of the OP's hand. That is, uh, that tells you everything you need to know right there. OP with a Goyf, that's a good find. But it can't stop the Skelemental from connecting, and that's still got to be our play. Why don't we go get a basic mount and start fueling the Kroxa for an early escape? Um, that's going to grow the Goyf, though, to a 5-6, so maybe we actually shouldn't. Yep. 
Yeah, okay, let's just attack here. Okay. Skelly connects. Bolt and push go down. Okay, so our only problem right now is we cannot answer this goif, but we've got a lot going our way. Okay, now OP draws a red land after all of that. And what is it? Oh, it's Plague Engineer? Okay. Don't much care at the moment. If we draw just an out to Goyf, we're so imp incredibly favored. No, we're flooding. Okay. So if we fetch this turn, Bolt the Plague Man, the next turn we fetch Escape Kroxa. It's still pretty awesome. So if we had not flooded this much, we'd be pretty deterministically winning. Since we have flooded, it is still anybody's game. Especially because the opponent has now drawn the third land and it happened to be red. And they have flood insurance in the form of that peatland. Whereas we kind of do in the form of Kroxa, but not in as direct of a way and in a more disruptible way. Have they drawn in? No, they're going to crack. Sure. I was going to say, have they drawn a, a Thought Seize or something? That'd be great for us. Yeah, I'm just going to bolt the Plague Man. Like, our life total matters a lot here. Good to know that Plague Engineer is in the deck, I suppose. All right, just draw a Fatal Push, one time Fatal Push. Oh, the Flood, what's going on? Well, now we just hope they don't have an answer to Kroxa and everything could still be okay. Exile five other cards from your graveyard. We've got the four mana, so let's get this. Completely preposterous levels of flooding on our side of the table, my friends. Bloodbraid Elf out of the hand, nice. Croaks outsizes Goyf, even nicer. So, the opponent is still the one that's on the ropes. They're playing totally off the top. They don't have the fourth land to make some of their bomb top decks live. But they top deck a Baron Moor, okay. Into a land, nice. All right. Come on, top deck, show us something. Bruh. Bruh. Okay, I think we have to attack. Like, if they just take it, then we're dead to, like, a lightning bolt off the top. But there is absolutely no way. Like, there's no way we should be flooded this badly. Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. So let's just attack. Deal our three. We hopefully spook them into a jump block, but they're far enough behind that maybe they're supposed to make us have it. So that's what they do, I think, wisely. But now they are dead to a simple attack. Having taken the hit. So once again, we just fade a top deck one time. Like, they, they break one time and they're dead. Come on, one time. <laughs> oh man both decks having such bad luck here in this game 2 of round 5 uh oh here's the attack you didn't have you don't have the bolt you don't have the bolt no okay we have a cling to dust how interesting 
So we just have to begin by going to attacks, right? Huh. No, that was, that was, no, it wasn't bad because we can still just stay alive by gaining the life. Sure. Oh my god, I just skipped past the attacks? I seriously thought I had clicked it. What the hell is happening to me at the end of this league? My apologies, guys. My apologies. What do we do now? I guess at this point we just say go. But that was so dumb. That was so dumb. What am I doing? What am I doing? Literally just misclicked. Um, what, wh why I was distracted enough to misclick is I was thinking, well, maybe we should have main phased the cling, right? Did they just draw? All right. Let's just see. Let's just see. Nobody panic. Nobody panic. I have not actually misclicked in a very long time. That was a straight misclick. Feels feels dumb. Feels bad. All right. OP with another goif. Yikes. All right. So now let's just cling to draw a card. And shrink the goifs, I guess. I guess the goif is probably the card that they were that they had in hand, right? Okay, we draw thought seize. I think that should be lethal. So we take the card away and then or just another Kroxa. I guess that's technically a safer way to do it. Alright, we're bailed out of my misclick. That was kind of a tricky spot anyway, though, right? Have they been slow rolling a bolt? No, they're, they've been, uh, they were bluffing a bolt. All right, so that was, a, that was a very weird, very weird end of the league. My bad on the misclick. I would like to go back and maybe review, but I'm just too tired right now, that cling, the draw of cling to dust. My first instinct was, okay, something to have in the back pocket. Let's just attack and see what happens. But then, like, as I moved to attacks, I was saying, okay, Maybe we should have clung main phase, but then there's a tension between do we cling to gain the life and play around them having lightning bolt, and do we cling to just draw a card, which is broadly much better in that situation, but because we were at exactly three, we had countervailing incentives, and then I just completely clicked the wrong button. Again, it's been a long time since I misclicked, so... Give me a break. <laughs> and, and we won anyway because we drew, because Kroxa is literally OP. Uh, Kroxa, just like, as you can see, crucial to our victories. Remember when I evaluated this card and a lot of people were, were saying um, it's too often a two mana lava spike. It's not a relevant turn two play. Number one, you're still getting a card out of their hand, so it is still a one-for-one -one trade with upside if it lava spikes. And on Jund, we are a resource. We are a deck that attacks all of their resources and seeks to use all of the resources available to us. And the incentives are very similar here on Rakdos. And, you know, the, the notion that Krox is not good because it trades one-for-one, -one, sometimes two-for-one if the life matters on turn two, and then comes back and escapes to win the game... I never, I never agreed with that, and you can see, I think in this league, how Croaks's, um Lava Spike mode really adds up. It really adds up. I think maybe even more so in a deck like this, where we are dealing big chunks of damage with stuff like Lightning Skelemental to turn the corner out of nowhere, or where we are kind of chunking the opponent's life down to a point where we can go wide with seasoned pyromancers and like makes kind of suboptimal plays and attacks to squeeze over the line. Croaks's deal threes really add up. So sorry about the misclick at the end there. Um yeah, that was still good enough to get over the line though the way we navigated that and Let's see. A pretty successful league overall in that, number one, we got a decent result. We cashed it. Number two, I think we showed the strengths of this deck a lot in terms of, like, 
when the Skelementals came at the right time, they were amazing. In some specific instances like that, we also also showed the specific strengths of cards like Kroxa and Spyro. And Cling to Dust was really good here too. Um, and we also, broadly speaking, showed that the deck can kind of dumpster big mana in a way that most other black-based mid-range decks could only dream of doing. We also had a bit of a free loss. It felt like a free loss that we gave up due to mulligans in round three against Prowess. And again, the companion. The companion is what's the nail in our coffin in a matchup like that. Like, we just need to really lean into Kroxa and Spyro to come back from stuff like that, and we weren't able to. Uh, what was our other loss? Oh, it was one, round one against Aspiring Spike. Uh, he's an excellent player. Uh, he's on a really sweet brew. And even that was... I, I don't want to call it a brew. Like, it's a pretty recognized archetype, right? But, you know, leaning into Spreading Seas is something that I don't believe is stock. But even that loss showed us something very important about the deck, which is look at all of our extreme color demands. We do have a low curve, uh, we do have a lot of one drops, but obviously the one drops all require some kind of colored mana, so it's not easy to double spell if one of your lands is an island. And then if you go beyond that, Dark Confidant and Ransack the Lab have a generic mana, they only cost two, okay, that's fine, but Dreadbore is hard to cast, Kroxa is hard to cast, and really hard to escape. And then everything in the 3-drop either requires two colored pips, you need either, either double black or double red, or double red and black. And we even saw a moment against Spike where one of our lands was seized and we couldn't cast turn 3 elemental because of that, because it, it doesn't even give us a generic in the cost to work with. So, I think this was an extremely instructive league overall, for this archetype, its pros and its cons, and I am by no means a master with it. This is like my third ever league with it, um, but I hope we did it justice, and I hope we saw some very interesting gameplay. It felt like good back and forth, pretty much fair modern throughout the entire league, and that is just what we love to see. We even got Necromentia a little bit of time in the sun where we had that really interesting decision at the end there whether we take care of one of one half of the mini combo of um tireless tracker and dry to the elysian grove to stop a top decked land from being really good or whether we just go necromentia take all the titans out of your deck we went with the latter we went with the spice and it made the opponent scoop after the subsequent draw step so I think this is a really fun league. Alex Cote, my friend, happy birthday to you. I hope you enjoyed it as well. A better result than the last time out, despite an inauspicious start where we got 0-2'd in round one. I was afraid we were in for another 2-3 and three or worse, but we did manage to cash. And again, I hope I showed you some really fun gameplay along the way. So happy birthday again, my friend. I hope uh, the loss of your shadow that compelled you, uh, the misplacing of your death shadow that compelled you to play this deck in the first place, leads you to many more successful and fun runouts with Red Rock in the future. So thanks again to Alex for funding the Donation League. Happy birthday, bud. And thank you so much to our newest four Patreon supporters, David Castillo, or Castillo. Maybe it's David Castillo. I couldn't tell you. But he's an inquisitor. He writes awesome stuff in YouTube comments. Matt Picard, one of the unearthed. Awesome to see that. And gotta say, I love all patrons, but it's even more awesome. It's even more awesome to see two of the Veiled Tier supporters in the same week. I don't know if that's ever happened before. Very, very generous from Rob Orndorff and Vladislav or Wadislav Yurenka. Hope I didn't butcher your name too badly, my friends, and that's going to do it. Thank you so much for watching, and stay tuned to the channel. Maybe we've got another league or two to get in before uh, Zendikar Rising is legal. But whether or not that's the case, I suspect it will be. Either way, we're going to be playing more on the channel, especially once ZNR comes out. We've got all the cards we've covered in spoilers to actually test out. So I hope you stick around for that. I hope you subscribe to the channel. I hope you give this video a thumbs up and I hope to see you for the next one. Everybody out there have a wonderful day and I will talk to you soon.